Hello, everyone. I'm Stephen Spatz, Assistant Outreach Librarian, and on behalf of Library Director Joe Lucia and the staff of Falvey Memorial Library, I'd like to welcome you to today's Anthropology Lecture Series event, featuring a talk by Dr. Richard M. Leventhal, entitled, The Collapse of the Ancient Maya, Interpretation of the Past, and Preserving the Future. This is the fourth year of the Anthropology Lecture Series, and this year, Falvey Library is delighted to join the list of sponsors bringing these presentations to the Villanova community. The Office of Academic Affairs, the Office of Mission Effectiveness, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And we're equally delighted to be providing a space here in the library for discussions of topics in anthropology, a subject which does not have departmental represent representation here at Villanova University. Last month, we heard Dr. Lowell Gustafson speak on the topic of language and humanity. And on Tuesday, April 14th at 1 p.m., Dr. Michael Zimmerman, professor of anthropology at Penn and of biology here at Villanova, will give a presentation entitled, Where Did Humans Come From? Where Do We Go From Here? Be sure to check the event posters and our library web pages at library.villanova.edu for more information. We're fortunate today to have with us Dr. Richard M. Leventhal. Dr. Leventhal is a professor of anthropology at UPenn and curator of the American section at Penn Museum. He's also the founder and director of the newly established Penn Cultural Heritage Center. This afternoon, Dr. Leventhal will be discussing with us the legacy of the ancient Maya. Our understanding of the history of the Maya has undergone some evolution lately in light of recent excavations at the site of the ancient city of Shinantunich in western Belize. And we have an opportunity here in this session to explore the implications of these new archaeological developments with a scholar who through his work, is bringing sensitivity to the treatment of cultural heritage and deepening awareness of the value of sincere preservation efforts. Would you welcome, please, Dr. Richard M. Leventhal. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try not using the microphone. Can you hear me in the back? Good. I have a fairly large voice. If there's any problem, just let me know. What I'd like to do today is, in fact, tell you two different stories. I want to talk first about the collapse of the Maya. And I know this is a little dark because of the light coming in, but I think you'll be able to get much of what I'm going to try to show you. The collapse of the Maya. And we're talking about a society that goes back to about 1000 BC that still exists today. There are Maya people living in Guatemala. In fact, the majority of people living in Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, Mexico, um, and uh, Salvador. But to look at why this great society collapsed sometime around eight or 900 AD, um, and we're talking about a massive shift in population that I'll talk about in just a second. And the second story is in some sense about the destruction and the attempt to preserve the Maya past. And what you can begin to see here is a, a cut through this ancient pyramid. It's hard to see really, but this is a looter's trench as they go in looking for a tomb and then down here is a carved monument with a slot taken out, and this is a piece of a monument that they cut out in order to sell on the open market. And we're talking about that second story is about the preservation of Maya cultural heritage. And the question is, who are we preserving it for? Are we preserving it for the tourists like you and like me as we climb a pyramid? What about something like the Liberty Bell? That's something that we see as our heritage here in the United States. This is something that we were talking about over lunch. It is a bell that doesn't work anymore. It's a piece of metal, but we don't want to destroy it because it represents something to us. And if this showed up in the British Museum one day and they said, we bought it, and we're going to keep it, what would we think of that? And that's the same as what's happening with in terms of the ancient Maya. And I just wanted to show you my favorite t-shirt because it says, it's a picture of four Native Americans holding guns and it says, Homeland Security, fighting terrorism since 1492. <laughs> so talk about cultural heritage. We have to completely rethink our perspectives when we think about Native Americans in the land that we are now on. But we also need to think about the Maya in terms of not just the past, but as living people. And here is a ceremony that's going on in, and on Palm Sunday in southern Belize, a very remote section of the Maya region. Um, but a, a ceremony that's going on about Palm Sunday is they recreate and dance part of their past 
but also the Zapatista revolution that's going on in Chiapas, it's still going on today, as they are trying to claim part of their political rights, but also their rights in terms of land, identity, and their future. So, so let me go back to the first story, the story about the collapse. And this is a map that shows you where we are. Uh, the country of Belize is here, uh, right along the coast. And here is Belize in a larger map. And the site that I'm, I excavated is a place called Shinanjanich, located here off to the east of Tikal, right on the Belize side of the border between Belize and Guatemala. Talk up again, the discussion about who controls what. This border is, has been in dispute for, for dozens of years between Guatemala and Belize and continues to be a dis in dispute um, about who owns it, whether this was originally British Honduras, now it's called Belize, it's an independent country, but Guatemala still claims it. But the collapse, this entire region was occupied by the Maya in some, time, some areas going back to 1000 BC. And by the time we get up to about three or 400 AD, we're talking about millions of people living in this region. Major cities, cities of upwards of 200,000 people. So really large pre-industrial uh, pre cities. Um, an entire set of relationships between these cities, large cities like Tikal and Kalakmul being some of the larger ones. And then sometime around eight or 900 AD, within this region, we have massive depopulation. And the depopulation we're talking about is millions of people. We're not talking about a couple hundred thousand. We're not talking about one million. We're probably talking about displacing, losing, from an archaeological record, in the range of three to five million people. A couple of questions. Did they move? You know, the one thing we can find archaeologically is when, when five million people move. We can find them. <laughs> they build new cities. They build new houses. We know what's going on. They didn't move. They didn't die overnight. There's no evidence of disease. What do you do when there's a massive disease that occurs within a large population? In fact, when the Spanish arrived and you get disease occurring among the Native Americans, what happens, or in the Black Plague of Europe, what happens with the disease? What you do every day is you take all the bodies of the people who died that day and you, put, you either put them in a big pit and you cover up the pit you dig another one the next day, or you burn the bodies. And archaeologically, we have found that with Native American communities and contact that they had with the Spanish in the 16th century. We don't find that among the Maya. So what we begin to understand, this is a very complex shift in the political, social structure of this system that I want to talk about. And we learned a lot about this at the site of Shinan Tunich. Again, I, is there any way to turn some of these lights out? No, I'm sorry, because these are great pictures. <laughs> I would, it's kind of like I'd like to do puppets up here for you. They're really good pictures showing a, a huge pyramid. And uh, some of these I'm going to have to talk about what I'm showing you, and it's going to be a little hard for you to see, and I apologize. Uh, this is a pyramid. From the ground here to the top is about 130 feet. This is a massive construction that was built sometime between around 600 and 800 A.D., Shunan Tunich is a site, it's probably the most important Maya site in Belize, not because of its important archaeologically, but because it is one of the major tourist attractions in the country of Belize. And I was asked by the government of Belize to excavate specifically to, to increase tourism. And I, in fact, I'll show you what we did. And in fact, we were able to increase tourism. It went from about 10,000 before I went there to about 50,000 to 70,000 now visit the site on an annual basis. Um, so we were, we were interested in examining Shinan Tanich, but not just in terms of development for tourism, but also to study it. And one of the interesting aspects of Shunan Tanich is that it, it is occupied just, it's developed before the collapse, survives the collapse very slightly, and it gives us a window into this collapse period that's very interesting. Now, it was a huge project that went on for about 10 years. This is the downtown section of Shunan Tanich, the ancient city. And all these little black specks here are house mounds, or basically out parts of the city. It's a small city. It's not one of the large ones. It's not about 100,000, 200,000 people. We're talking about 10 to 12,000 people lived at Shinan each, let's say 700 AD. Relatively small. But we surveyed this whole area. This is where, again, the downtown section of, of Shinan each, and we, we cut lines through the jungle. 
and I could t you know, talk to you about how we did that incredibly difficult work. I had graduate students from Penn, from UCLA, from other universities working in this very tough rainforest environment. But today I'm going to talk to you mostly about the downtown section of Chenant's Niche. What was going on there, what was happening, and what the changes were that we began to see through time that tell us and give us this window into the collapse. So this is the map of the downtown section. This is the big pyramid that I just showed you. A series of plazas to the north. This is where the, the ruler's residence appears to be. A couple of sort of roadways going into the plazas. You can see an outline of an elite residential group here with the road, their private road into the downtown section. Um, and this was probably the pyramid where the temple was that they prayed to their, their ancestors and their gods. Um, so this is the downtown section. And we're going to excavate one of the series of these buildings, and I'm going to give you two, two examples of what we're doing. One of the interesting things we found is that if you look at this map and this map, you see that, sud that at about 700 to 750, they built this building right in the middle of the plaza. There's a big plaza there. Right in the middle of it, they built this building. And so we wanted to understand why did they build this building there at about 700, 750. And we excavated it. Um, this is what it looked like before we excavated it. This is what it looked like when we were finished. We we're just in the process of finishing the cons what we call consolidation. Not reconstruction, it's consolidating what we see there. Uh, I want to show you more. Um, we're cutting through the building, and then I'm sure this one doesn't show at all. One more time. Try the next one. Now, here we can see something. What we found there as we dug through this is that they used a very interesting sort of engineering technique that I had never seen before. They built very small little bins. How do you build a pyramid? I mean, let's start out. How do you build a big pyramid? And what you do is you build it like a birthday cake. What you do is you build a wall maybe this high. You build it as big as the pyramid that you want. And then you fill that wall in and you create sort of a, a, the first layer of the, of the birthday cake. And when you're done with that and you put water in and you put dirt and you put rocks and you level it out and you make sure it's really solid, then you go step it up. And this is exactly what they did, but they did this in a very strange way. Because instead of building these huge bins, they began to build very small bins. And that's not more than about a meter and a half by about a meter. So about three and a half by three feet. So you have one bin there, one bin there, another one over here, and so on and so forth. And there are more in that slide that I, it's going to be hard to see. This makes no sense from an engineering perspective. Not only do they do that, but it turns out, and again, it's very hard for you to see, this bin is full of all only green dirt. This bin is only full of green rocks. The bin next to it over there, and you could see it in this, is red dirt. And so they've built these very small bins that make no sense from an engineering perspective. And they made sure that only a specific type of dirt or rock or whatever went into that bin. We'd never seen this anywhere, in all, and I've been excavating for 25 years. People I was with had been excavating for, for a number of years, had never really seen this. And we don't really understand it. But we begin to, we've come up with a series of ideas. We think we see that this, in fact, may begin to represent the community of Shenantanich coming together to build this one building in the middle, to divide that plaza, plaza that I showed you. And it's an attempt for different families. And we think that each of these represents a family at Shenantanich coming together and representing themselves in the construction of this building. And that it's a, these are small little bins that are up deeper than something like this, and there are bins on top of bins. But it's very clear that it's very tightly controlled and we think that this is an attempt for the community to come together in the way they are sh trying to build this one building in the middle of their community at about 700, 750 AD. So you see the shift. A big plaza suddenly is broken up with this building right in the middle that seems to represent the community. In addition to that, we then excavated to the side of this building and found an ancient wall. Doesn't look like much, and I, I apologize, but this is this wall. And in the construction of this wall, it literally stops the movement of people to the side of this building going back to this back plaza area. 
So in fact, we find that not only do we have this building there, but we have a wall that does not allow people to move into the back area. We actually found a doorway in that wall and that people were able to move coming this direction tended not to move in that direction. What we think is happening is that the, the city is constricting. The city is much is, is larger. This area is abandoned. This area becomes abandoned. They put a wall there. They put this building there. And so that they create this plaza right in front of the main temple, in front of the community temple, if I could call it that, with a wall that stops the movement of people out away from this plaza, this becomes the public space. They've constricted, they become smaller, and they're defining the space that they're working within. One that we then went to this side of the building to look for another wall, never found one. What we did find is an ancient ball court. Now the ball court, and I don't have time to go into what a ball court represents, it's a part of a ritual game that the Maya played. Not like baseball in the Phillies where you have 35,000 people looking on. This is a ritual game about the continuity of the world on a day-to-day -day basis. But actually, ball courts are the entrance to the underworld. There's a long story there, and I don't have time to go into it. But this entrance to the underworld is not what you want to go to. So you don't walk through a ball court. So on one side, you have a physical block. On the other side, you have what I would call an ideological block. It literally is a wall that says, don't go there, but they didn't have to build the wall because it's, you know it's a sacred space. And people, the Maya, understand the concepts of sacred space, as we do. When you walk into a church, there are certain sections of a church you go to. And there are other sections you're not supposed to go to unless you are at a certain level within the society. So we've begun to see the, this city constricting and changing. That's just the excavation of one building. Let me turn to the excavation of the main temple here. We start out with basically a grass-covered mound. We begin the process of excavation, massive excavation. We're talking about, I'm showing you years of work in front of you. And at the very end, this is what we produced. This is what we showed, and this is what we developed for, for the tourists. And in fact, I'm going to talk about this freeze. This is a freeze made out of stucco, made out of plaster, that the Maya had built as part of an earlier building. Maya pyramids and buildings consist of sort of layers, one on top of another. And so when they would build a small pyramid, and it was time to build a bigger one, they didn't destroy that building, they built on top of it. And they encapsulated it not only physically, but also spiritually or ideologically because they encapsulate the history of that earlier building. And then they build another one, and another one. And quite literally, you dig some of these buildings, and you can find six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, or 15 earlier buildings inside. So in fact, what we see here is the last building up on top here, and then they covered up this earlier building, which is why it was preserved for, for our excavations. And in fact, you're not going to see it, but I'll tell you, here is the floor of that earlier building. The freeze was up here. Behind this student who's sitting and mapping is a doorway of the earlier building that was then covered over by the ancient Maya. I have to take my word for this one. Here is parts of the freeze as it was excavated. And one doesn't find plaster freezes very often. In the Maya area, there aren't more than three or four or five of this time. There's, later on there's some, a few more, but still it's not a common occurrence. And one other question, just as a side note, is how do you preserve a plaster freeze? Stucco, you can't move stucco. You can't, once, you, once you pick it up and you flex it slightly, as anything will flex, stucco just breaks and it turns into, into dust. So you can't move it. You can't actually put a roof over it. Because by putting a roof over it, it actually destroys it faster. We have found that out over the years. We brought in Mexican conservators who are the best in the world on, con on stucco conservation. They go around the world to study this stuff. And, and they have so much of it in Mexico, but they also go to Italy, they go to other places to give their advice. We brought them in, and what they said is, you can't save it unless you rebury it. So what we ended up doing was reburying it, and I'll show you that process in just a little bit. And we made a, a fiberglass replica that is now seen by the tourists. And we tell the tourists it's a replica. I mean, we're not trying to shock them. But this is, in fact, that freeze. 
Now, I'm not going to go into the details of this. It's, it's a fairly complicated one. If you look very carefully, you can see two eyes and kind of a mouth here. And you see two eyes and kind of a mouth here. These are sort of earth monsters, and I'm not going to get into that. The critical one I want to show you is this figure right here. If you look very carefully, you can see two legs. These are the knees there. Feet would have been here. An arm over here and an arm over there. This is a portrait, we believe, of one of the rulers of Shunan Tunich. <coughs> and we believe, since under this, underneath this was a doorway and another doorway and a third doorway, is that they portrayed their gallery of rulers on this building. This is their representation. This is their, this is their political scene in terms of representing the 12 previous rulers around the building. This one's facing off to the side, to the, to the west, and the ones to the north we think would have been the ones that were the current rulers, the individual in the middle. And then later on they put a, 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 a building on top, and they showed, they kept one piece of this frieze visible to the north. So they had a lower frieze and then they had a newer upper frieze. The upper frieze is completely gone. We have fragments, we can't put it together, I mean literally fragments of this size, so we really can't put it together, but we know they had a later freeze. Oh. Um, we also conducted a series of excavations and tunnels into this. One of the things you have to do is, you have to decide, can you put a trench into a 130 foot tall pyramid? Can't do it. So what do you do? You tunnel in. And you get people who are careful and smart and you do a tunneling, which, is, which can be dangerous, no worse than mining, but you've got to know what you're doing. And we hired people, and we, I did it, and I've done it over a number of years, and we also know what we're doing, and worked very carefully to make sure nothing was moving on the inside and was going to collapse on us. It's very tricky at times. And several tunnels we started, we couldn't go more than a meter or two in. The very last, we did identify the very last building built at Chinatunich. This is it here. It's on the west side. It has round columns. Round columns are very strange. They only occur after 900, after 1000 AD. We have them here, probably one of the earliest buildings with columns in the Maya area. It's a small little building facing to, to, towards that large temple. And it's the very last building built, and it was the last, after that, the place was pretty much abandoned. And this is where it was located right here, facing into this very much taller building um, off to the east. As I say, and you can't see here, the Maya buried buildings. And here's a series of buildings that were buried. And they built that little temple on top of this later on. But I want to just show you, if I can, I hope it will show, what we found in this little tunnel right here. Yeah, OK. So we tunneled in, and we found an earlier building. And what they had done is they took this room, and they blocked off a doorway. And so as you entered this room, you had to turn to your left, and here I have turned to my left, and there's a staircase going up in front of this earlier building. So back to this, this we found that right here. So what we began to find is from the very bottom, we've got a staircase that takes us about a third of the way up. Then there's a building. There's no staircase here. So the question, I'm a relatively logical person, how do they get to the top? I have to ask the question, how do they get to the top? From this to this, the only, we found two staircases, one hidden over here, literally hidden away with a wall that separated the people climbing the staircase from anybody who might be seated out here or standing out here. We also found another hidden staircase right over here. We found some staircases in the back to get them from here up to the top. This is a temple you might have seen from Tikal, one of the big tourist attractions in Guatemala. Hundreds of thousands of people go there every year. Why did the Maya build, build, build big pyramids? I mean, I, I, how many of you ever visited a Maya site, just out of curiosity? I'm sure as you climbed the big pyramid, you said, why did they build these things? And why did they have small steps? <laughs> Clearly, you've asked the question. And here is, in fact, a temple with a central staircase going all the way up. The one we were excavating that I'm talk, talking about did not have that central staircase. Here it is. Why did they do this? I think what we're beginning, to, what I've begun to focus on is 
understanding the nature of ritual activity for the Maya. At the very bottom here is a series of portraits of rulers called stela. The Maya rulers, we believe, and in modern day Maya communities, they still do this. They do this in terms of the church and setting up stations of the cross and so on. They would probably process around this courtyard, stopping in front of each of the ruler's portraits, probably with incense, prayers, discussion of their past, pretty much what goes on in the White House. And then, we, I believe, they would then begin to process up the stairs. What's at the top? The top is the temple. The top is a representation of, of, of gods of the heavens. And I think that when you talk about Egyptian rulers and Maya rulers as being divine, it actually means that you're cha they're changing who they are. And I think what happens is that when they process here, when their feet are on the ground, they're human. But as they process up the staircase, they are literally going through a transformation. They're becoming divine in front of you. That process of change, which is very much part of ritual activities among modern day religions, is also occurring within ancient religions. And I think that in fact the rulers, and not everyone got to walk up these things or get carried up. The person who got to the top in fact changed in who he was. That he was divine. He was sacred more sacred at the top than he was at the bottom. So it's a process of transformation. And transformation is a critical part of what power is within societies. Power within ritual, power within religion. So here we actually see that this process of transformation took place in public. You could see it happening. That's about 6700 AD. What I think happens at Shinantanich is that process of transformation changes. Now, I, I detest this hypothesis. I'm uh, forget it. I'm not a scientist, um, but I wanted to figure it out. What was going on here? And what we then did, and you can't see it. And I apologize. We we dug a tunnel right where an earlier building might have existed inside this one. With no, there was no staircase on the last building right here. We found that for sure. No staircase. So we dug in looking for an earlier staircase on an earlier building. I'm in a little tunnel, I'm a big body, not much to show you, but if you look very carefully, here's the balustrade, here's the staircase, one, two, three, four, five, and you can see it right here, here's the balustrade here, and there are the steps, right there, there, three, four, and the fifth one's there. We found an earlier staircase inside this later building. So in fact, what we found is that the earlier staircase was like Tikal, went right up, the transformation of the ruler from being human to being sacred took place in public. I think it took place in public at Shinantanich early. And then later, the ruler would walk up to here and then disappear, walk up another section completely hidden from view, go around the back of the building, take the final uh, set of stairs up to the top, and then as if by magic, emerge at the top having transformed himself from a human into being sacred and powerful. And so the process of transformation which during the earlier period took place in public now takes place in private almost by magic. And I think that tells us something about what's going on. That the nature of the power of the rulers is being questioned at this time. Their power is being questioned and the process of transformation, which is the basis for much of this power, is taking place privately, magically, rather than publicly. And the public transformation is one where you buy into that. This one is a little bit more magical, a little bit more mysterious, and one where I think the power is being questioned in order to then force a change in the structure of the building, which reflects the change in the structure of the society. We also see other changes that you can't see in relation to an, another uh, ruling complex way off in the back. 
But let me, so let me just very briefly talk about this. Here is the large, this is a reconstruction of the downtown section. This is the large complex here, the large pyramid that we excavated. And you can see there's a staircase there. There's not one going up in this last one. Earlier on, there was one that went all the way up to the top. This is the building in the middle that had the wall at the very, very end that blocked it off. What we begin to see is that at a certain point, about 750 to 800 AD, sections of the city are being abandoned. This section is abandoned. The, the royal residence is abandoned. They're literally taking stone from these other buildings to use in the maintenance of these buildings. The last public space of Shunan is right here. The last public space. The entrance way over here is abandoned. Outlying sections are abandoned. The city is becoming smaller and smaller. And what I think we begin to see is not a disease, not a shift in terms of dramatic um, movement of people. We see a political system that after hundreds of years can no longer bend and change to the times and gradually falls apart. And as it turns out, fairly quickly falls apart in terms of the abandonment of a place like Shinantanich. Where did the people go? I think what we're talking about is a system that falls apart. And I don't want to say look around you today, but when a system falls apart, you begin to lose things such as health care issues. You begin to not be able to deal with health care. Birth and death rates shift. Birth rates go down. Death rates go up. Survival rates go up. Excuse me. Survival rates go down. Excuse me. Um, so what you begin to do is we can lose a fairly large and sizable population based upon the shift in the political and social structure of a system. And that's what I think we see happening with the Maya, is that it's not a dramatic event. It's not a smoking gun. What we see is a dramatic change in the political and social system that forces this system that had survived for hundreds of years to literally fall apart. The one thing we can guarantee is that all societies that develop will collapse at some point. Now, death and taxes are two things that are definitely going to come. I promise you, societies will collapse. Our society will not be around 500, 1,000, 5,000 years from now. I don't know what, I'm not going to try to predict, but we're not going to be the same 500 years from now. Part of what we were trying to do was to also develop the site for tourism. And so here is what we are doing is taking carved monuments that had been left out in the rain for, for hundreds of years, but in terms of beliefs for the last uh, 35 to 40 years, and move them into these buildings for preservation. We don't have a lot of te uh, great technology. People just pulling and, and getting rollers made out of logs and moving these monuments into place. Creating a visitor center with maps and displays to explain to people what they're seeing at the site of Shinantanich. Burying the original plaster or stucco frieze and taking a Fiber, making a fiberglass replica, which is by itself is a long presentation about how we did that, uh, but literally making, since we couldn't take a mold from the, from the stucco freeze, because that itself would cause destruction, we had to make a clay replica down to the millimeter, about 20 feet below where the freeze was, because it couldn't be hanging out in midair, 20 feet below it, take a cast from that, and then uh, cast, uh, make a mold from that, cast the fiberglass, and eventually bury the freeze and take this up. And unfortunately, you can't see much of it. But this is what we end up with. This is the uh, fiberglass replica, the same color. Literally, point by point, one meter behind this is the original stucco freeze. And this is just an example of the crew that we had on an annual basis at Chinantanich, consisting of archaeologists from the United States, from Belize, um, local workmen from the local community there, a very large crew of anywhere from 100 to 150 people on a daily basis that would work six months a year uh, for this excavation. And so we gradually then saw the shifting that would occur, whether it was the building of that community building inside, trying to sort of, I think, focus on the idea of community and the existence of a community, but the, build, but the city is beginning to fall apart as the wall is built, as the sections of the city are abandoned, as the last remaining public space, sacred space, is right there. And then we see the collapse. So this window upon that is a very narrow one. But we can see the attempts by the rulers and by the people of this community to survive 
it eventually fails. And part of it is for us in terms of the tourist development to both tell that story, but also to preserve this for tourists and for other people. I just very briefly want to talk about cultural heritage, preserving of what we see here um, in the jungle. I hope that you have seen photographs. They're not nice photographs, but the photographs of the destruction of archaeological sites in a place like Iraq. These are landscapes that you can see from the air of literally a moonscape with these holes in, in the ground where they have gone in to try to rip things out of the ground and to sell them on the market. Um, I won't talk about museums that are buying them that shouldn't be buying them, like the Metropolitan Museum, like the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, uh, like the Cleveland Museum of, of Art, and like the Art Institute in Chicago. I won't talk about them. <laughs> I won't talk about the collectors in New York, or Philadelphia, or Boston, or London, or Tokyo, who are buying these things illegally. Because we're talking about the destruction of the heritage of the past. What I can show you, at least for the Maya, is, and we can't get these aerial views because of the jungle cover, is these trenches that looters have done into the middle of these temples looking for tombs, looking for objects that they rip apart in order to take that final object to sell it on the market. Some of the stuff is incredibly valuable. Maya pot, beautiful Maya pot can go for a half a million dollars or a million dollars. Maya carving can go for even more than that. Two monuments from the sites called El Peru. One at the Kimball Art Museum down in Houston, one at the Cleveland Museum of Art. The only public information they give at these two museums is this one says it was bought in 1967, and the acquisition number is 0.29. This one says the pro pro provenance history is the New York art market, 1969. It was bought by John Stokes in New York. It was purchased by the Kimball Art Foundation in 1970. By the way, 1970 is the critical date. The reason they're using 1970 and 1969, it's the critical date in terms of what's legal and what isn't legal. 1970 is this UNESCO convention. My belief is they were bought much earlier than that. We won't go into that. But let me show you what happens in a place like Dos Pilas, another Maya site. And I'm just picking and choosing things that I can show you good examples. Very elaborate ancient city located here in Guatemala. Here is a carved monument here, big stela. Up the upper part would show a ruler. Here is the bottom part. It's very hard to see, but if you look carefully, you can see a body here. Here is his butt, his knee right here. He's, he's hunched over. His head is up here. He is, he, his hands are bound behind his back. This is representing the ruler having conquered this person, having conquered this person who represents another Maya city. That bottom part was cut off to be sold on the art market. It's now lost. We don't know where it is. This is another monument from Dos Pilos. And if you look very carefully, right here, this is another ruler. This is his hand coming up here. You can see his fingers right there. He's holding his staff of power. And I'm not going to go into what it represents. It's, it's a complicated iconography. But it's his staff of power. No different than the Queen of England has a staff or a, a crown. This is what represents power. There it sat in the jungle. There it's gone. And I could go on, I mean, I'm only going on for three minutes on this. I could go on for the afternoon. I live nearby, I can get my slides, and I can take you for the rest of the afternoon on this. This is what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. Just to give you a sense, here is, and these, the yellow here are ancient buildings. The red slots are looters' trenches. Almost every section of this has been looted. The site of Naranjo in Guatemala. Shunantanich is nearby there, it's divided by border. Go across and there's Naranjo on one side of Shunantanich. I, I visited Naranjo several times. One time, um, and badly looted, not too bad. About a year after I was there, looters took over the site. I'm not talking about a couple of guys wandering around and digging a trench. I'm talking about a team, 20, 30, 50, I have no idea how many, took over the entire site, killed a guard, ran off the other guards, stopped the tourists from going in, and looted the site for about a month and a half before the Guatemalan army decided to go in. The amount of stuff that came out, we have no idea. 
extensive destruction that's occurring. There are sections of Guatemala we've now found, and I work with law enforcement in this country to help stop the illegal importation of material coming in. One of the things that we're finding is that there's now the connection between the movement of drugs, the movement of arms, and the movement of antiquities. Antiquities is now number three on the list of the illegal things moving around the world in terms of the size of the economy. Billions of dollars moving around. And the northwestern part of Guatemala is right now off limits to the Guatemalan army because the drug traffickers are in there and they're dealing with drugs and they've got airstrips and so on and so forth and they're dealing with the destruction of cultural heritage of the Maya. It's massive. And here are some more trenches at a site very near Shunantinich. I have been shot at by looters. I have seen looters and at work. Uh, it's an ongoing process. And not only is it just the destruction of what we see, but this is a mask from another site. This trench at a place called Octoncon went right through a mask like this. It's stuck out. They can't move it. They'll destroy it because they want to get behind it. Now, not all destruction is just through professional looters. Here's a site that I was part of the discovery team with some local people at a place called Ushbenka in 1983 in southern Belize. We've just cleared this area. Beautiful carved monument here. Remember that. It's hard for you to see it, but you can see the lines at least here. Excuse me. It says, fuck you. They burned it all down. They burned that carved monument. This was the local community that did this. And they did this because of the dispute between them as a local small community out in the middle of nowhere and a fight with the central government. And how do you get back at the central government? You take what the government says they own that's within your community and you burn it down. So they burned their ancient past to say this to the central government. So the destruction is not just professional, it's about the social system. So what we see then in terms of the destruction of the cultural heritage of the Maya is, is the loss of the archaeological context. We can't learn anything from these things once it's destroyed. The destruction of monuments, it's, it's, we talk about the dis world cultural heritage is being destroyed, the Maya. It's our past, but it's the Maya past. Destruction of artifacts, which is portable stuff moving around. And most importantly, we're talking about the loss of cultural identity and cultural heritage. It's as if that Liberty Bell shows up in the British Museum, and what we're saying is that's our heritage and we've lost it. And what's happening to the Maya is the same thing, but what's happening in Iraq is the same thing and around the world. And our belief is that if there's a market, if people will buy it, museums and private individuals, they'll dig it out of the ground. So we're trying to stop the market and we need to. So let me just summarize. At Shinan Tunich, we see two things happening. Number one, we see that we're able to look at this moment, this window onto this incredible change of the collapse of the ancient Maya. It's a very complex question that we have been studying for dozens and dozens of years as archaeologists. It goes back into the 19th century. I'm just adding my two cents to this. But the critical piece is that we cannot think of it as an event. We have to think of it as a process of change within the society. And at Shunan Tunich, we see it's not warfare. We see it's not a disease. We see it's not movement. What we see is that the system <coughs> can fall apart. And, if, and I, you know, if I were to give this talk a year ago, I couldn't say this. But look around the system today that we're living in, and look at how quickly everything can fall apart, how interdigitated everything is, that when one part falls, the rest of it can fall also. Are we about to have a collapse? I don't think so. And I don't think President Obama thinks so. But does this show us how weak a system can become? And the answer is yes. And that's what I think is happening with the Maya. And the glimpse at Shunan Tunich, in terms of the changes within the system, the changes within the architecture that show us that process of change, give us a very good sense of how a city like this, really quite small, can, in a very short time, with the system falling apart, be abandoned. And then the question about the preservation comes down to, are we preserving things for ourselves or for someone like Mel Gibson to use in a movie like Apocalypto 
that you may have seen that came out about two years ago. Didn't quite make it in terms of it being a major thing. But this is how Native Americans and Maya perceive that movie of Apocalypto. Is it for him to be able to use, or is it in fact for the Maya? And here we have Kekchi Maya, who go, who, who have visited other archaeological sites of the Maya to understand their past. And we have to think about what the heritage can be used for. Heritage can be tourism, but it's also for people's identity and their understanding of who they are, who we are with the Liberty Bell. And certainly my grandparents, were, or great-great-grandparents, were not around when the Liberty Bell was being used or as a symbol of the country. I'm second generation. But it represents America, and therefore I take that on as part of my heritage. They're taking it as part of their heritage, and we have to understand that both tourism and identity can go together. But we have to represent that and understand that relationship. And so the work that we do in the Maya area has to connect both to study the past, but also to preserve the past for the present, and to preserve the, pre the past for the future. Thank you very much. Um, if there's time, I'm happy to take some questions. Please. Um, what's the con what connection do you find with the economics of the situation? I know there's, there's a fair amount of writing about Mayan collapse being based on failure at the food production level. Is, is, so the question is, is the collapse, can it be tied to the collapse of the food system and economic model? <sighs> I don't think it works in terms of environmental shift, i.e. drought. Um, I don't think in terms of the loss of fertility of the soil. There's some of that. I think we see some of that. I think what we see is that the system is a complex set of, set of, of, of activities and processes, and that a drought or the fertility of the soil causing some problems most of the time, the Maya could recover from that, as we recover from stress upon our system. And the stress comes from many different sides. What I think happens with the Maya is, for some reason, the system becomes so con set in concrete that different stresses, and I think the environmental is one small stress within the larger picture, that that causes part of the system to crumble. But I also think it's a question of the power of the ruler the political system and the social system and the relationships, the ability for a society to move, allow people to move vertically in the system is very critical to get new thinking, but also to allow for fluidity in that system. When that breaks down, when the people at the top are at the top because they're born into it only, the system becomes set in concrete. And I think what happens is it's so set in concrete that environment, politics, and so on all happen at once, and the system just falls apart. So I think it's part of not the smoking gun. And I'm actually quite tired of looking for smoking guns. <laughs> Societies don't change because of one thing. We, I mean, the Maya know how to deal with the drought. It happened constantly. We know how to deal with droughts. I mean, there's been a drought going on in the southwest in the Colorado River for many years. We're doing it very poorly, but gradually we're dealing with how do you deal with the water of the Colorado and perhaps let some of the water get into Mexico. So we can deal with the stress. It's not the smoking gun that's going to change society. It's the system that's going to fall apart. You had a question. Yeah. Um, as term, in terms of the identity of the looters, mm -hmm. does it tend to be uh, like a lot of external people, like uh, visitors coming into the country with that express purpose? Or do you tend to see Mayas like, turning on their heritage in order to kind of compensate for the changing of the times and deal with this new economy that they're introducing? Sure. The question is, do we see Maya doing the looting within their own community, or are these people from the outside? And it's a combination, as I'm sure you suspect. We do have something called subsistence looting. People who are poor, it's their bank in the backyard. You go out, you dig a pot up, and you sell it for 50 bucks. Somebody who eventually might get much more for it, and it goes up the, up the trade system. There's a small number of those people, less and less, because they're aware and community, the way you save these things is not because I'm going to put an army there or the police go there, it's because the community says, don't touch it. More and more communities are saying, don't touch it to their own people and to outside. 
I would say right now there's a larger number of professional looters. Some of those are mild. And they're paid reasonably well for that as a job that they go do every day. Um, but some of them are also not Maya. They can be from Latin America, they can be Guatemalans who are not Maya, who are Ladinos, who are doing this. It's hard. We haven't done enough studies of the looters. And I'm an anthropologist also, so I believe in sort of ethnographic studies. I mean, participant observation. And I do know of a couple of people who have gone out with the looters to do that work. It's not been enough, and I'm not sure I could send a student to do that either. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah. Uh, the Mayans have writing. Yes. Um, and the writing, we can sort of date. Is that correct? We can date very clearly. Okay. Is there anything in the writing that indicates a collapse of political systems or of uh, changes within the community that might explain, again, not a smoking gun, but kind of a trend of what's going on? And the question is the Maya. The ancient Maya had writing. Now, I didn't have time to get into the great detail in that. Does, does the writing help us understand the collapse? I'm summarizing your question. And the answer is yes and no. Because the Maya, they continue later on, certainly to the north, this area is pretty well abandoned. So we don't have people who are looking back and writing specifically about the collapse. We sort of do, but it doesn't. That's a com complex story about what's going on later on at Chichen Itza which is occupied later and further to the north. But leading up to the collapse, I think we do have, the writing does tell us something. It doesn't say a, there are problems. Because these are the public monuments. And oftentimes public monuments don't say there's an ongoing problem today because monuments are looking at the past. And we might write about the depression, but we don't write about the depression at the moment. We write about it later on. But we do see that there's a couple of things are happening. There's increased warfare. Now, warfare is not the smoking gun, but we do see increased conflict between these communities. Before, we saw treaties, we saw more interaction, marriage, alliances, and so on, more warfare. That could be population pressure as population grows and there's more butting of elbows. That could also be part of the system beginning to break down as the interaction is, is being questioned and asked about and, and pushing back one to the next. We also see, I think, in the writings an increased statement of power by the rulers. By definition, they are powerful rather than through a variety of, of not reasons that you have to explain, but, but structuring the nature of power in more subtle ways than saying over and over again, I'm in charge. And later on, we see more and more of that. And the final thing I'll say about that is it also correlates with an increased construction of elaborate palaces for the rulers and their wealthy people just before the collapse. The amount of energy going into the elaboration of palaces just before the collapse goes almost through the roof, as if bigger palaces, I'm in charge, don't question. This is the symbol of that power. So I think that writing does help, as does the architecture, as do a variety of things. And I think more and more it says the system falls apart, rather than that smoking gun. Please. Your hypothesis about the change in the public versus private ritual change, yes. or ritual, yeah. is there a correlated uh, change in the Sealy and the hieroglyphics that would tell a, a parallel story? No. Um, but it's, it's a change that occurs very late. There are no monuments, for example, at Chinon Tanit that date to that period of change. Uh, and this is one of the difficulties. It's a very subtle type of change that there are other sites with other buildings that do not seem in the way I I'm an architecture specialist. Now, when I look at some of these buildings, I don't know where that staircase going up would be. And I'm, I wander around looking at this, making up rock lines to see where staircases are. There are other sites I'd like to go dig if I were to follow up on this specifically, uh, where this sort of Acropolis central spot does change, and I, I think in terms of the way it looks to me on the ground. Um, but I haven't excavated those. It is a huge process to excavate some of these big buildings to, to tunnel in and so on and so forth. And actually, I'm not planning on doing that. Uh, I have another project that I have in mind. So the answer is no, I, it is 
there are also plenty of later sites that still have the straight staircase. Yes. Yes, but see, uh, part of it is because I think we're talking, the way I would look at it is the system is breaking down in different ways in different places. And this is one particular example. And in fact, I think there are other sites there probably show similar types of things, but not other places. And so I think what's happening here is not what's happening over here. In fact, one of the other theories that's very prevalent today is this warfare theory. Arthur Demers from Vanderbilt University excavated those pilas and found evidence, absolute proof, showing evidence of warfare occurring. He then said warfare caused the problem. What I've said to Arthur, but also saying is, uh uh, it's a mosaic. There's warfare here, there's the questioning of the power of the structure over here, and so on and so forth. And this mosaic is complicated. So the answer is. There's also pretty good evidence that the severe multi year drought affected different cities to different degrees. Absolutely, absolutely. And we also know of earlier droughts where they survived without much difficulty. So you do have, it is that mosaic, which is this compl complicated statement on the ground that provides for this vision of process rather than that smoke and gun. Yes, I agree. Yeah. How do you as a scholar reconcile Native peoples that see your work, particularly physically tunneling into sites as equally destructive as leaders? And how do you deal with the sort of the, the idea that your work can then be used by leaders to highlight what's the good stuff to go take? Um, how do I reconcile my work with, with the Native American community, the Maya community, in terms of are we being destructive? Um, are we perceived as being destructive? And then perhaps are we teaching the looters where to dig? Let me start with the last one. And the answer is yes, we are. Your desire to save your own past. And that's the way it's going to occur. And the only way we can learn about that past is by digging in and so on. The other thing I'll say is the dig at Shenan was sanctioned by the local community. They performed an opening ceremony, and they performed it every year for us, where the shaman would come out and would pray over me as the director and over the project on a daily, on, excuse me, on an annual basis. Uh, they would close the site with us at the end of the year with ceremony. Um, and there were Maya people digging. They were digging their own paths. Um, I cannot say to you that I then had graduate students who were Maya, I would like to, I've, we've got some who have bachelor's degrees, PhDs are in the whole issue. Um, but I do think that the question of the connection of the Maya to this, to the dig, sometimes there are some projects where things have not been as pleasant, where in fact the archaeologists were seen as looters coming in to destroy the cultural heritage of the Maya. And that's, I blame upon the archaeologists for not explaining to the local community what they're doing asking permission to do it, and sometimes be willing to take no for an answer. What oftentimes happens is you get a permit from the central government, and you say, I'm just going to do it. And you really have to ask the community, and if the community says no, you've got to say, OK, and I'll go somewhere else to do it. Have you run into issues with the Mayans seeing it as an invasion of sacred space? Um, because I know I'm, I study North American Native populations, and that can be very, very, well, that's very, key, yeah, very, you know, very key. And I work with a lot of Native, North American Native Americans on the same issue. The answer is, I have not personally run into that. What's interesting is when I started this dig, the local community of Maya said that though my ancestors did not build that site. And I said yes, they did, and they said no, they didn't. Uh, we came from over here, and it's a modern day movement that they're uh -huh. relating. About an, and I'm talking about an ancient site as if Maya to Maya, they're talking about I am Mopan Maya, and that's not Mopan Maya who built that. Very specific. However, change is now occurring where they're seeing that they get a that they're able to create a very strong political structure by saying, We are Maya, that's Maya, it's all connected. And so that there is more of a shift in that direction. Sacred space has become a little more difficult to identify in terms of ancient sacred space. But the answer is yes. There's more and more of that awareness of it. Um, all I can say is I think if there is respect and interaction from the beginning, I have had always great rapport with the local community. When there's not the respect and the desire to work with people, you're going to get your butt kicked. Be blunt. 
Um, that should be it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.